All I'm saying is Nagash got back up and started walking around, and Big E hasn't managed that yet. He's still stuck I, on I, his couch. I, I, I just like the analogy of like Big E is basically like an old 90s computer that you have like really good <laughs> software on that you don't want to go, and it can't be updated, and you're just like, I will just shut it off for a bit every day so it doesn't overheat, but I'm not going to shut it off for too long in case it never powers up again. Like, yeah, that's Big E. <laughs> and Nagash is like the Nokia phone of all things. He just keeps coming back. <laughs> he, keeps trying, he just refuses to break. Oh, you throw him at a wall, it just comes back stronger. <laughs> oh god! So that, and you can play Snake. It's brilliant. Yeah. Massive sidetrack. <laughs> Do you see that one where like someone they put a million volts and they threw a Nokia phone that still worked? <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Law Crimes' Beginner to Expert podcast. Now, to much of your delight, we are returning to the world of Warhammer Fantasy this week, and we are talking about a particularly interesting character uh, known as Nagash. And uh, I think it's going to be a fun one because he's, he's a bit of a meme, a bit of a, a bit of a silly goober as far as characters go. But before we get to today's episode, it's time for the question of the week. Uh, so I'm going to pass this over to Eli, who's got some choice uh, selections from last week's, yes. well, the other week's episode, I believe. You all answered very well. And the question was, which chaos god would you like to worship and why? And it was hashtag chaos me daddy. Very nice. We have, I, I chose five answers. Five? And the Damn. Last one. <laughs> There's a lot of good answers from you, subscriber bros, so I, the last one is probably my favorite. Oh, the third one is also really funny, too. Anyways, the first one is from uh, Luigi Super 4143 hashtag Daddy. I would worship the Great Horned Rat to force CA to add Thankwall in the next Total War Warhammer DLC. Yes. It was that one just for Colin. Yes. God, these are so and biased and towards him. Colin. <laughs> that cool. They are such next. simps for Colin's <laughs> like in the thing. It's okay, that's why I left the best one for last. So, uh, the next one is the Lucky Goblin uh, 5880. Eight Chaos, eight the Imperium, eight Xenos, eight myself, love me Malice, simple as. I love me Malice as well. That's <laughs> Chaos God. The meme God himself. That's right. I'm really a fan. Dang. Uh, yeah, not surprising coming from a Dr. Pepper fan. Anyways, All next. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I loved how lo I, I had a peek through the comments of, of that week's, and it was interesting how, like, I think there were more comments about the divide between ginger ale or ginger beer and <laughs> Dr. Pepper than the actual question of the week, which I thought was brilliant. Raise Pepper. Yeah, there's something about drinking mayonnaise in one of the comments. <laughs> <laughs> no, that man's not affiliated with either side. He's doing his own thing. <laughs> Okay, uh, this one is really funny. Samuel-TD7FB says, All hail Vashtor the Archifane and the Shadow Sun themed mecha demonic fleshlight he promised me. Uh, wow. <laughs> this is like getting spicy. Heresy. Filthy heresy. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's another call, call and comment. The Great Horned Rat, fastest way I can get to Lucius and sacrifice him to the rat entirely because the Great Horned Rat would find it funny. And the oh, last one, which I saved for last, which we pinned actually, it's, uh, he answered, sorry, it's Douglas Watson, 4234. He says, Corn because he ruins Colin's day every time he's mentioned. Good man. <laughs> wow, <laughs> it's like such a mix <laughs> today. <laughs> mean. Mean. <laughs> I must admit, I was surprised at how many people chose Corn, but a lot of them were actually like the most wholesome of all the comments. They were just like, ah, at least you know where you stand with Corn. Sounds, it'd be fun. It'd be fun. And then there's the at least you know where you stand. <laughs> God. Yeah. They sound like so it. unenthusiastic. That's what you get from Corn workers. <laughs> Shout out to all my Slaneshi fellas. Yeah, same. Sirens. They're here for you. Yeah, the police are coming to arrest him. <laughs> 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 We have to say a big uh, thank you though for the people who do comment because we do appreciate you a lot, uh, brothers and sisters. They're very, Indeed. very spicy. They're very funny. Which and is... as you can see, we read them. <laughs> all of them. We do. We try not to read it too much because this is like we, we all need to be surprised when we yeah. do this, but I, I also think, yeah, after we not, definitely when we're devour. Picking, we're like we'll read them afterwards, and we're like we've done the question of the week, and then we'll go like <clears throat> and have a look through all of them, to see what's going on. We um, 
Speaking of that, though, I believe we do have a another question for next week. Uh, the wording may be a bit scuffy on this, um, <laughs> but we thought we, as in theme, with our uh, subject today, we thought we'd ask which Warhammer character would you resurrect? A uh, slight tidbit here, it could be from any uh, setting. We'd also would like to know how you would resurrect them. And this one will be hashtag such is the power of. We will explain that <laughs> a little bit later in the video. Hopefully people will enjoy that. No spoilers yet, but that is um, that is something that will uh, come up. We're very excited for it. Uh, right. Would, is there anything suppose else? Without further ado, is is it time? Is it time to talk about Bone Daddy himself? The it, Bone Pope comes. <laughs> <laughs> the Bone Pope do be cometh. Uh, mm -hmm. It is time. So, I will be beginning, boys, with our story, and it starts in the beginner section, and we are straight into the. Some could say the superior world, but it's the Warhammer fantasy Correct. world. Sorry, I'm Tom. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. No, um, no uh, Imperium here today. But uh, we begin. Take a nap. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> Imperium. I awake. You know, Warhammer fantasy. I sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, we begin our story in the land of Nehekara. Hopefully, I pronounced that correctly. I think I did. But this is. Um, now, within, especially if you're playing like Total War Warhammer, it is a barren and harsh desert land. It is no life exists upon this plane. It is utterly um, just even hope goes to die in this sort of creepy and dry place. But this was not always the case for the land of Nehekara. It was once a vibrant and flourishing place filled with many various so various human cultures which had um very like city states dotted around the lands i will specify as well the land of nehekara is somewhat south of what's called the badlands in the warhammer map and i guess below it is kind of what would you call that colon just below the lands of nehekara below. It's like uh, the, the Southlands, the jungles of the Southlands. Yeah, the jungles of the Southlands. And There's lizard there and a lost dwarf hold that probably got eaten by lizardmen. Is that the one that they uh -huh. talk about in um, Vermintide 2? It's like the guy's yeah, cousin. It's, it's it's exactly that one. Oh, yeah, Cousin Ocri. Cousin yeah, oh, my God. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's exactly that one. So the land of Nehekara, we will now travel back many thousands of years to the time when uh, humans actually existed and lived upon this uh, land. Each of the city-states in Nehekara, many of them are famous, like Kemri, uh, Lamia, things like that. There's many like them have their own unique cultures. But the general land of Nehekara, which if you probably haven't noticed by now, or some of you knew, you maybe don't know much about Warhammer Fantasy, is basically ancient Egypt. Um, there's no... Like it, it, it's they, you know, if they copied someone's homework again, Warhammer, don't be surprised. Um, but all these unique city states are unified by like a single language and they sort of share many customs. Although each city is a bit different, they kind of specialize in uh, different ways. But the overall culture of the land of Nehekara is completely dominated by ancestor worship, they revere the dead, much like ancient Egypt as well again copied someone else's homework but our story within this land begins with the rise of nagash now nagash was born a human um won't be that <laughs> won't be that way for very long but nagash was the firstborn son of ketep of kemri and this was the king of kemri nagash was known to be a smart and ambitious child who unfortunately to him would never inherit the throne of his father. And this was because Nagash was given over to the mortuary cult. And in the lands of Nehekara, throughout the various city-states, the mortuary cult, or sort of the death order, very much just a cult, they were formed in the time during the Great Conqueror Cetra, Cetra the Imperishable. Is he Imperishable? Yeah, Imperishable. He's not like a salad. You know, he, he will go he's off the, the one fridge. He's the one who formed them. 
he did. And these, this uh, cult, they seek the secrets of eternal life. It sort of began the, I wouldn't say maybe began actually, but it somewhat enhanced the culture of ancestor worship within the lands of Nehekara. And Nagash was, such was the power of this cult that all firstborn sons were, or like nobility were given over to be members of this cult and they would serve. And Nagash would be a, just even as a child, he was literally hand over straight away and he would grow to be a scholar slash a priest who would practice the death rites of the Nehekaran nobles of Kemri. But Nagash was ambitious and he was not happy with being um, a priest, shall we say. He definitely coveted the throne and this would eventually consume him, this ambition. It would cause him to delve into magic, which he first learned through captured dark Eldar's, old, old, old Eldar, dark elves. Yes, you. <laughs> excuse me. I did that last time as well. He threw some captured dark elves and this would slowly start to, I wouldn't even say it corrupted him because his heart was already black on the inside, shall we say. And this would birth the tradition and the magic of necromancy. So before this, this hadn't really even been a thing. The mortuary cult had never come close to this. So Nagash would resurrect people from the dead and he would use this as a tool to usurp the Kemrian throne and begin his tyranny. Now, the rule of Nagash uh, as the king of Kemri, so he did, uh, we will explain later how he did that. He uh, he was awful. <laughs> Nagash was, did not care about anybody. The people were enslaved to the buildings of the infamous Black Pyramid. And this was a vessel for power and also magic. But such was the awful rule of Nagash Eventually, he was rebelled against and he was crushed by an alliance of the seven kings of Nehekara. And this would be the first war where Nagash would unleash resurrected dead, the undead against the Nehekarans, who, as a culture who worshipped the dead, the idea of fighting their dead horrified them very much to the core. They were completely uh, unable to reconcile the idea that they would attack their reverent, you know, dead ancestors. But eventually Nagash did uh, perish within this conflict, but it was not over yet. You know, he was just tapped. He 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 fell out the ring and he got someone else tapped him and he went back in. So he basically... Re- added no bell and just got back in there. <laughs> yeah, he's like, you know, I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. <laughs> and he would reanimate himself. So this is the f- he did die, I think, properly for the first time, but he would latch onto his corpse and live again. He said, no, no, he, just <laughs> he just went, he just straight up, no. And eventually Nagash, you know, he rose again and it would unsurprisingly declare another war upon Kemri particularly and all of the states of Nehekara. He would try to create a ritual to kill and resurrect the entire world to be his undead empire only to be slain by the last king of Nehekara, al Kadizar, and also the Skaven helped him do that. Uh, that'll be a f- We're going to have so much fun mentioning that later because it's <laughs> just so on point for Skaven. Nagash, again, mainly thousands of years later, would resurrect again, and he would go to the northern lands of the Empire. He would attempt to find some of his artifacts, like his crown. He would also do battle with... Sigmar Heldenhammer, the glorious man himself, only to be again put into the grave because, again, Sigmar was given, uh, you know, I would say, like, protagonist, protagonist powers. <laughs> Sigmar Unbarogan. Oh, he's not Heldenhammer. Yeah, is he? He's Unbarogan. No, he's, he's still, still the chief boy. Sigmar Unbarogan. Of the Unbarogan tribe. We'll, we'll mention more about that, too. And uh, he does pop up a few more times in the lore for this part, but... We wouldn't truly see Nagash again until the end times. So sorry, end crimes. The end crimes, again, Nagash will be resurrected and he would unite all of the undead uh, that he managed to resurrect within the world to his banner to fight the forces of chaos. Though we should specify as well that about his character, Nagash did not do this because he wanted to uh, defeat chaos. This was 
one of his biggest traits is his arrogance and he essentially wanted to replace the chaos gods but he was sort of the you know the enemy of my enemies my friend sort of type of deal with many of the other uh, races he'd also bind with the magic of shayish the death i think it's shayish isn't it the death magic of the warhammer world and despite all this the end crimes did happen and the ritual would be interrupted and the world would end very sad but we thank you manfred I yeah. will never forgive Manfred. Yes, Manfred has betrayed us all. But that's not the end of the story for Nagash. He would also arise again in the Age of Sigma, and he would be one of the uh, starting gods to join Sigma's pantheon during the Age of Myth. He would eventually inhabit and rule the realm of Shayish, but he's also intrinsically tied to it as well. It's hard. We'll explain more about that later. Eventually... Uh, the ever so ambitious and, you know, not willing to share Nagash, he would betray Sigma. He would attack the forces of order before eventually a lot of them and even himself were defeated by chaos. He would come to conflict with um, the forces of Sigma and Archeon. Sig Again, Nagash, yeah, he, uh, Nagash always thinks he can take on everybody. He would eventually again attempt to create the Black Pyramids. So he's kind of, you know, I mean, someone's got a bit of a theme. And unfortunately, again, this one was met with not great success, medium success. It did birth the um, infamous Necroquake, which we'll talk about a bit later. And the kind of one of the last few things we see Nagash doing is he battles, um, I think, fairly recently in law with Teclas of the A Elves or. You know, <laughs> sorry, I hate saying a elves, <laughs> but he would battle with Teclas, who obviously was a pre, you know, the god Teclas from the previous world, and that's the current uh, sort of overarching story of Nagash all the way up to his timeline. Does anyone have any thoughts? Perhaps any feelings about the <laughs> the undead bone daddy so far? Seems like a real jerk. Kind of reminds me of Abaddon, actually. No, he's In a way, way cooler than Abaddon. Oh, he's taking a lot of L's, bro. I don't know. No, he's, it's all part of his master plan. You don't get it. You don't get it. <laughs> it could be so that they do, they both have that kind of, um, there's an ambition within two, the both of them that's similar, I'd say. I think they do, although again, Abaddon's got, you know, he's, was it, he's a star scream to someone else, whereas, uh, Nagash is not. The, he's not the. Nagash is the star screen to Nagash. Yeah, his other personalities. Um, but with that being said, though, we're gonna delve straight on into the 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 true story, the fleshed out story of the greatest necromancer to ever live. Colin, are you ready to take it away? I am more than ready. Go for uh, it. Buddy. To start, though, I think I think we'll start with a quote. I've got two uh, throughout. And uh, Andy, would you mind reading this this first quote? Uh, yeah, I can I can do that for you. I shall put it in the in the general sidebar. Okay. <clears throat> there will be no escape, no blessed oblivion. I can end your life as easily as I can extinguish a candle. And before your corpse is cold, I can reach out and grasp your soul. You will be my slave for all eternity, and I shall laugh. At the depths of your pain, such is the power of Nagash. Such is the power of Nagash. That, that quote is like... just unbelievable. That's why he can't be Abaddon, because Abaddon has nothing like that. <laughs> it uh, does. It does go hard. Abaddon's is just like my dad sucks. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Emperor bad. Is it in, is it uh, weird that in my head every time he says "such is the power of Nagash," I just picture him throwing up gang signs? And I know he probably does it. <laughs> I feel like it just has to be done every time. He just like, such is the power I mean, of Nagash. My gang signs, you know, ripping your soul out of your body, then maybe. <laughs> I mean, if there's magic happening at the same time. <laughs> but True. Magic does usually involve a lot of hand waving. For some reason. I know, I know uh, things. Eh, who knows? But it's magic. It just works. Um, but... That is, a, that is a good quote to introduce you to Nagash. And just before I get started with his story, a little bit about him. Uh, he's just, like Hal said, he's, he's just born bad. Just born morally incorrect. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of Warhammer characters, uh, when they do evil things, they're 
experts in mental gymnastics and gaslighting themselves into thinking that serving chaos is in somehow the morally correct choice. Don't worry, uh, about, it. Don't worry about it. It totally is, bro. Yeah, bro. Slanesh is totally the morally correct choice. <laughs> Uh, Nagash, meanwhile, when uh, you ask him why he does what he does, he simply says, I'm evil, and then, and then kills you. He's, uh, he knows what he's about, he's, uh, he's an asshole, and he's, he's proud of it. Although he does call himself a just god, <laughs> because he's got, he's, uh, he, he's a character. Massive control you know? issues. Like, just, that's his whole vibe. Massive, like, just, I need to control everything. Oh, yeah. Uh... So I will uh, begin with uh, his story. So as Hal said in the beginning, we go to the kingdom of Nehekara, and uh, it is still ancient by the time of his birth. Nehekara is thousands of years old. Uh, it's around the tail end of its golden age, but things are still good. Uh, they're about to not be good because Nagash has been born, but they're still good for now. Um, and as Hal said, he is the firstborn son of King Katep of Khemri. No relation to DJ Katap from Total Warhammer. Uh, big shame, I know. Uh, but on, for some reason, in the Hekara, they do they do it a little bit topsy turvy because usually, you know, the firstborn son or child is the heir to the throne. Not in uh, not in the Hekara. The firstborn son goes to the mortuary cult to figure out how to live forever and be a be a magical lich priest. It is the secondborn son who becomes king. And Nagash's brother Thutep, sure enough, becomes the king, and Nagash has to be a lich priest. He's not a fan of this. He's uh he quite wants power. He he wants to be control freak, like we were saying. He he wants he wants to be the head head honcho. Um so yeah, he's he's not happy. And making this even worse is that there was one conflict he was briefly put in charge of. Uh when, uh, pardon me, when the commanding general of that conflict died in battle. Nagash was the fill in leader. Uh, and even ruled over a city for a bit. But once the conflict was over, he was swiftly removed from power and even had his names expunged from the conflict. He was only ever referred to as a great leader in the history books. So not only have his uh, accomplishments been erased, he got a taste of power and then had it yanked away from him. So he's not, he's not happy with that. And to compound on this, the mortuary cult, not being a king, so he's not happy with that, but it does allow him to grow his magical prowess which is going to make things much worse for everyone later on. Now, during the time of his birth was the War of the Beard, where the High Elves and the Dwarves started massacring each other because the guy in charge of the High Elves at the time was an absolute idiot. And the reason this is important is because good old Malekith, responsible for 80% of fantasy's problems... Phoenix King, baby, too, Phoenix King. You are so unbelievably wrong. <laughs> Good old Malekith, the not true Phoenix King, the Phoenix loser. Uh, 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 -huh. he, uh Fire Lord Sozin. What happened in End Times? Uh nothing. Blessed what by Assyrian, wasn't he? What's no, that? he wasn't. That was cringe. Doesn't count. We'll get to it later. <laughs> it doesn't count. It's not, <laughs> it's not his episode. It's not his episode. <laughs> uh Malekith, though, had sent some uh dark elf agents to do a little prank we like to call a false flag attack. Uh, and get the High Elves and Dwarves hating each other. And those high, uh, Dark Elf agents that Malekith sent uh, got captured by a neighboring city-state of Khemri. They were handed over to Khemri to be sacrificed in religious uh, rituals. And Nagash said, as a, you know, as a member of the Mortuary Cult, he's like, Hey everyone, this is under my purview. I will take it from here. So he took those three Dark Elf prisoners and put them in his basement. And he gave them a choice. He said, listen, you can either teach me how to do magic, because I see the magic you're doing, and it doesn't require the, uh, the Nehekaran gods to act on our behalf to do the magic. You just do it. You teach me how to do that, or I'm just going to kill you. And the Dark Elves, not wanting to be killed, were like, yeah, all right, sure. Uh, they were very you know, arrogant about it, of course. They thought he was a, he was a mere human. So they, still, uh, they were still kind of rude about it. But, uh, oh, and of course, they withheld some stuff from Nagash because they didn't want to want to tell him everything because then he'd just kill him. But Nagash now learned that dark magic is uh, a thing, which of note, normal humans are not supposed to be able to just use dark magic in Warhammer. It's uh, too, not only tainted, but just too much for mankind to handle. 
So Nagash is already proving he's just simply built different from the start. Uh, they try to escape, because at a certain point they've gotten familiar with the layout of the uh, place he had kept them in. And right as they get to the edge of the little basement and the prison he had set up for them, they find Nagash. And he gives them another simple offer. Beat me in a magical duel and you can leave. Otherwise, I'm, I'm killing you. And sure enough, despite them being elves and good at magic because of that, Nagash uh, kills them and consumes their souls. Because he is getting a fantastic start to that whole dark magic thing. So he's, uh, he started, he's starting off strong. And going forward, he's now learned proper dark magic. He's going to go ruin everything now, because that is what his job in life is to do. He creates a cabal of uh, like-minded individuals with, of course, himself at the top. Uh, and they do, they do all sorts of uh, evil dark magic things. Uh, most prominently among them, his chief servant, Arkan the Black. Uh, cool dude. It's a shame he's serving Nagash, because he'd probably be a lot cooler under literally anyone else. I have to ask, how does he get the nickname or the epithet? The black, because I remember in lore, it's like um, some is like a reference to his teeth, or is it because he gets it later because his bones are black? Oh, I know. Uh, <laughs> he's just got really bad like hygiene and dentist. Like he keeps well, going to the dentist. Is like, are you brushing your teeth? I can't remember the. Yeah. Um, I can't remember no, the canon reason though why he gets I, that like there's name. There's a couple different reasons. Oh, God, I'm trying to remember what when we had Cody Bonds on. He was we, saying. Uh, did we talk about that on that time as well? We, yeah. we did. We I can, did. I can't remember. Um, he said like think, there's a couple of different answers. Yeah, there's a couple. Like one, it's a reference to like this root uh, that when you chew it, it turns your teeth black. Oh uh, yeah, that was um, another. The second interpretation is that he was he was uh, he was a degenerate before he joined Nagash. Like he like just, I think like palace prostitutes would refuse to touch him because he was just that gross and stinky. Yuck. Uh, so that's another reason. And the third reason, Ark in the Black. He's a dark necromantic wizard. You know, Ark in the Black. Just. The kind of name you give someone that's a, an evil wizard. Uh, but, and with his cabal, he does a couple important things. He creates an elixir of immortality, which naturally requires dark magic and human blood, because he can't do anything that's not horrendous. And he pens his nine books of Nagash over the course of a couple, uh, over the years. Uh, which are not only some of the most potent sources of necromantic magic and knowledge in the world... They each have a little bit of Nagash's soul inside of them, so no one but him can ever get the full use out of them. Uh, because I was, I, was, I was kind of a, like, because you're saying he wrote nine books. I was just imagining him on like a press tour. Like, <laughs> hey, I've got this new nine books of Nagash. And just like on like breakfast television shows, just like, so what have you been writing about? It's like, well, <laughs> so book number one is like, I don't know, just the it's idea of him. <laughs> yeah, like life, life lessons from Nagash. Like, kill all your enemies as soon <laughs> as possible. It's just like blank pages, and that's about it. Sacrificing yeah. humans, one hundred and one. Yeah, yeah. You can come to his like his book signing, but he's probably going to take your soul. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with this, uh, he has he now begins con uh, getting more and more followers. One night, his brother Thutep learns of his uh, plans. His advisor tells him that Nagash is not only consorting and creating dark magic cabals but also probably definitely going to try and kill him to take the throne. And so Thutep took his bodyguards and himself and went to stop Nagash. Many of Nagash's servants were killed, but his inner circle and, of course, himself were not, and his brother's bodyguard were slaughtered to the last. He had his brother entombed alive, who would then starve to death. Yeah. And the next morning, Nagash walked on the throne, sat down, and everyone was far too terrified of him to do anything about it. Which... I can't say I blame them. <laughs> I, uh, I would not be speaking up if I was there. I'm just going to be honest. Mm. Uh, he then proceeds, this is all in Kemri, by the way, the greatest city of the Tomb Kings. He proceeds to bankrupt it to build his massive Black Pyramid. Uh, the economy tanks, the people, are the servant population is tanking. They need to go take slaves, and they're dying. And every time someone dies, they are entombed into the Black Pyramid to make the evil magics around it all the stronger because he is Nagash is the worst, but he's he's very knowledgeable in being an evil bastard. He isn't, he isn't knows that, how to do things effectively. Isn't that also isn't wasn't it like considered a great insult when he built the Black Pyramid because oh. it was oh, yeah. too um 
Do you want to explain that bit? Uh, yeah, so out of respect for Cetra the Imperishable, no one built their pyramids taller than him. Uh, out of respect and fear, he would resurrect himself to just slap them silly. Nagash, meanwhile, was like, no, I'm the best, and built his Black Pyramid even taller than Mighty Cetra's. So not only is it an evil Black Pyramid, it's also a monument to his massive, massive ego and a slap in the face to Cetra. So Nagash is making his entrance onto the Kemrian, you know, the political stage with not the best look, but nevertheless, his followers grew in number because everyone wants to be immortal and he had proved a way he can do it. So he gets all sorts of people uh, under his banner, priests, nobles. There was a rebellion in Kemri and uh, Nagash responded very simply to this. He raised the dead for the first time in Warhammer Fantasy's history cementing himself as with a title he would have forevermore, the Great Necromancer, which that goes hard. And in with the rebellion, he sent the dead after them, killed everyone, uh, and then killed his wife. Uh, why not? <laughs> she, why not? Uh, why not? Who was his, was his brother's wife, I should add, because Nagash needs more things to add to the list of him being the Ooh. complete worst. <laughs> Uh, this also uh, relatedly broke a bond, a covenant with the Nehekaran gods. So now the gods leave in disgust over how much of an ass Nagash is. Everyone else in Kemri, meanwhile, is watching the single worst human being to ever live just grow more and more and powerful. So seven uh, of the Kemrian city states band together. They form a seven nation army to go and take Nagash down, and they are successful. Uh, it is horrifying for them because, uh, since you know, based on the idea of ancient Egypt, they very much revere the dead and obviously didn't want to attack the dead because that's quite the no no in uh, Kemrian or Nehekaran society. But they had to do what they had to do, and Nagash's forces are destroyed, but his pyramid remains because they just can't get rid of the damn thing, and Nagash escapes into the desert. And now we begin the, the next little arc of his story. So, Nagash wanders the desert so far in that even, like, jackals and vultures waiting for him to drop aren't following him anymore. Uh, because the Warhammer fantasy world is very big. I think it's about twice as big as Earth. And he's oh. just wandering around the, the not-Sahara desert. One night, his wounds and the effort is too much for him, and he dies. And while he's dead, the spirits of the dead, including his brother, harass him and ju judge him for the horrible, many horrible things that he has done. Uh, but... In, uh, in a trend of Warhammer fantasy characters just simply proving they're built better than 40k characters, he dies and just re-inhabits his body. He's like, death death ain't for me, chief. Uh, which I can't help but notice the Emperor has yet to do, so point one for Nagash. So, uh, Nagash is built different. I think well, the Emperor, resur they explain that the Emperor dies and resurrects every day because that's the only way to keep him going essentially and there's like isn't there like a thing where the inquisition have like inner wars where they fight over someone to or let him die trying to kill him, yeah. someone to let him die so he can become a god and i think i think in the most recent lion book there's a plot to stop that happening so i think it might be true if the emperor did die he would actually become a god i guess kind of like what you know nagash you know what i mean all I'm saying is Nagash got back up and started walking around, and Big E hasn't managed that yet. He's still stuck I, on I, his couch. I, I just like the analogy of like Big E is basically like an old 90s computer that you have like really good <laughs> software on that you don't want to go, and it can't be updated, and you're just like, I will just shut it off for a bit every day so it doesn't overheat, but I'm not going to shut it off for too long in case it never powers up again. Like, yeah, that's Big E. And Nagash is like the Nokia phone of all things, and he just keeps coming back. <laughs> he, to, he just refuses to break. <laughs> oh, you throw him at a wall and he just comes back stronger <laughs> oh, God. <Is> that... <laughs> and you can play snake it's brilliant yeah. massive sidetrack <laughs> do you see that one where like someone they put a million volts and they threw a nokia phone that still worked <laughs> i believe it uh, it was a, yeah, oh, there's also those video. stories of like someone put like a mcdonald's burger in like a safe for 30 years and it came out like, it had rotted <laughs> and it's like what is this made of how is it still a burger dude <laughs> Grade F meat is just built different. <laughs> <laughs> it can't rot what's already rotten. Jeez. Oh, damn. Uh, but uh, speaking of both rotten food and putting thing like putting stuff in places it shouldn't be, 
After Nagash inhabits his body, he encounters a party of Skaven scavengers. Uh, killing three of the four, the, the fourth one just gets the hell out of Dodge, as Skaven are wont to do when they're outmatched. And Nagash, you know, he's hungry. Figures might as well eat the Skaven, so he does. And he notices that something in their blood gives him a, a bit of a power boost. He's feeling a little bit better after he eats them. And soon enough, he discovers it's because they have a substance called Warpstone in them, because the Skaven eat it. He finds a chunk on one of them, figures, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, and eats the Warpstone. Warp and, uh, which I would... Probably worse for you than... Oh, not Well, maybe not quite as bad as a McDonald's cheeseburger, but definitely <laughs> don't want to be eating it. And uh, it does two things to him. It restores his strength and heals his wounds. It, it supercharges him at the cost of completely throwing off his senses, and he just wanders around the desert for over a century, just lost. Uh, he's just no idea where he's going. But eventually he comes down from his trip and wanders over uh, to the mountains to the north of Nehekara. And in it, he finds a tribe of barbarians ruled over by primitive nobles. And being the great, evil, powerful wizard he is, takes them over because he is the great necromancer and begins mining out of the mountain of Cripple Peak for Warpstone, creating his fortress of Nagashazar because his ego is the only thing and they were close to his necromantic prowess. Uh, as you might expect, there's Warpstone there, which means there are Skaven there. And the Skaven proceed to invade, because that's their rightful Warpstone. But by the Corned Rat, they will have it. And so begins a tale of both of the sides being just completely awestruck at how the other just does not run out of soldiers. Uh, because Nagash just raises anyone who dies from the dead, rats included. And you're never going to run out of Skaven to throw at a problem. It's 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 just not going to happen. There's too many of them. I love that the Skaven is like, my great-great-grandfather fought in this war. <laughs> and it's technically <laughs> true. I, uh, it, was, it was also like three years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, but, uh, yeah, so that's that's the war for uh, Purple Peak for the Warpstone Mines. They're just throwing corpses and Skaven that soon become corpses at each other. And eventually they reach a truce that neither side expects to last for more than five minutes, but it's slightly more productive than killing each other. The Skaven will mine the mountain for the Warpstone, and Nagash gets a cut in exchange for not constantly throwing zombies and skeletons at them. So again, uneasy truce, and the Skaven and Nagash are naturally putting in plans to screw the other side over during this whole time. But for the time being, Nagash now has his constant sorts of warpstone and necromantic magic uh, as a result. He forges some of his evil artifacts he'll have going forward. Uh, one of them is Morricane, his evil armor, which isn't particularly important. It's just, you know, bad guy evil armor, but it's a cool name and it's helps him stay alive, um, alive for a, a manner of alive. the world. Alive. Wow. Uh, alive. Alive in gigantic quotation marks. Pardon me, I didn't mean, I didn't mean to offend all of the zombies watching the video. <laughs> Did you just miss living him? <laughs> no. uh, Pardon me, excuse everyone. Excuse me, I know, groan. I flubbed. <laughs> uh, but more importantly, he makes his crown of sorcery, which is very important in several people's characters. So we'll get to that. Just uh, Just keep the crown in mind. Around this point, Nagash also was contacted by vampires, who uh, were Nehekaran nobles from the city of Lamia, who used his notes to recreate his elixir of mortality, or immortality. An elixir of mortality is just poison. <laughs> yeah, true. <Drew. laughs> <laughs> That's not well, just beer. Special. Just beer or something. Just keeps you alive for a little bit. <laughs> uh, so one of them contacts him, uh, or pardon me, a little bit more. Uh, the, uh, the imperfect problem with it was that it turned them into vampires, it gave them a huge uh, thirst for blood. They don't have their other weaknesses yet, because that comes later, but that right now, you can live forever, you gotta eat some people if you want to do it, though. So, they contact Nagash, they figure out he's still alive, and the first uh, uh, the first guy to say, hey Nagash, how are you doing? We're, we exist now, was telepathically strangled and staked through the heart from across the continent. Ooh. Uh, for 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 the for the, <laughs> for the horrendous crime of phone calling the cat, he was so he, he's a he's a cool guy like that. 
<laughs> but after that, Nagash figured, well, these guys are reasonably powerful because even the weakest vampire in fantasy can rip a knight in half. So he was like, well, they will make the perfect servants. And if they try and rebel, I'll just do what I did the first guy to them. So with his, uh, his undead armies growing, he now has his lieutenants. It's time for another try at Nehekara. And the second war against the t- uh, soon-to-be Toon Kings was far worse than the first one. The first one was mostly confined to Kemri. This next one, zombies are just all over the place, attacking nearly every uh, Nehekaran city at once. The River Vitae was poisoned, uh, which is the Not Nile, which millions died of famine and plague. Uh, Kemri itself, its population, was cut into a quarter of what it once was. And those who remained were too weak to do anything but hold farm tools as weapons. So when the zombie army showed up, they were very swiftly dealt with. Uh, Nagash had a different plan. He wasn't just going to throw zombies at everyone until the uh, the problem was away. He had a different plan in mind. He was uh, he was thinking bigger. And when he got to Kemri, he killed all except for one person. The king of Kemri, al Zar, who he took with him back to his... Uh, his base as a prisoner, and uh, Hal, why don't you explain what happens next? Oh, poor Alcadizar. So, Alcadizar was, as I said, he was the last king of Kemri. I think of all of Nehekara, I think they sometimes, like uh, Setra, they sometimes declare it a high, not a high king, but it's just still king, and they basically all the city states will it's, submit. Yeah, usually, the like the king of Kemri, it's the greatest city, so usually they're like unofficially the uh, the big king. Yeah, but they don't say high king. I think they just, they just keep king, and they have like petty yeah. kings and all that. But Al Kadisar was the king of Kemri. He had he has a, he has some cool backstory, which we might tackle if we do a vampire uh, focused one, which would be very cool. If we, you know, with um, Lamian <laughs> shenanigans there. But Al Kadisar was locked away in the city of Kemri, and this is Nagash is basically one. He's having his moment of triumph and. The ritual uh, has begun. He's consumed warp stone. He has consumed dark magic and energy. His black pyramid is popping off. You know what I mean? They're having disco lights in there. And essentially the land of Nehekara finally dies. And this is all witnessed by poor old al Kadizar, who can only out of his cell basically watch the thing he tried to protect the most essentially crumble into dust. No life, even from this point on, would ever exist upon the desert plains of Nehekara. And I think, yeah, essentially Nagash is building up, as we mentioned in the beginning section earlier. Nagash has got control issues, so his perfect world is a world of complete death. He is the master. It's an unending, unchanging world of dead. And he is essentially doing this ritual now in the wake of his victory to kill everyone in the world and then resurrect them. And it is alone that Al-Kadizar knows is happening. Or is it? Because in his cell, left alive by Nagash to witness everything he loves die, uh, Al-Kadizar finds his cell door open. He looks out and he sees cloaked Skaven ushering the king forward. I'm sure Eli will appreciate this Skaven moment very much because... The uh, Skaven put a warpstone dagger slash sword in his hand, which is known as the Fell Blade, which me and Colin have said between us is a badass name. It's like, that hits hard. Oh, yeah. Very aggressive. Uh, I'm not... In some parts of the lore, it's called a dagger. Some parts are called a sword. I just think it's just... It's probably that thing where it's like a weird in-between where like the Skaven thing is a sword because they're tinier. <laughs> and then Akadizar's like, it's just a long dagger. Not important, though. But big the knife. big, big, big Kniffy. Um, but the Skaven have carried this from the forges of Skaven Blight. And this was made from pure warp stone. It's incredibly poisonous and dangerous to even hold. You think about Nagash, he consumed it as like an undead lich thing. And he went delirious for like 100 years. Uh, Al Kaisar is basically, a, he's walking dead at this point. But he doesn't care because they've given him a blade and they've given him a direction. And even I I find this a really good tidbit, like in the law, which I always find funny. The Skaven that carried it from Skaven Blight all the way. Skaven Blight, for people who don't know in Warhammer, 
is like the underground uh, capital of the Skaven, Skaven Blight, Skaven, you know. And mm. it's uh, situated north of the Badlands, somewhat south of the where the Empire is, in the sort of what's yes. called like the Border Princes area. So they Since had to... Oh, okay, sorry? The, the Warhammer fantasy world is roughly shaped like Earth. Like, there's a differences, but it's roughly shaped like Earth. Uh, Skaven Blight would be roughly like the southern bit of France, halfway between Italy and uh, Spain. It's basically Nice. <laughs> Skaven. <laughs> Bonjour. Je m'appelle Skaven. <laughs> Je m'appelle Skaven. <laughs> you get stab stab in the back back. Um, but I always find this really funny bit in the lore. Like the Skaven, when they had to carry it down from Skaven Blight to obviously uh, to hand it over to Al Khazar. Uh, none of them could hold the blade for very long because they'd eventually die. So they obviously set off with like quite a few hundred Skaven and they were basically paying like pass the parcel. <laughs> like, And then when each one died, they like chuck it to the next one. So eventually like there's like just a long trail of like dead Skaven that you could follow all the way down. I find that quite funny. Awesome. I, I thought I thought Eli would enjoy that part because it, it's just so yeah. Skaven-y. Uh, and eventually... The blade is put in Al Karizar's hand and he knows what to do. Al Karizar makes his way towards the ritual site and attacks the somewhat surprised Nagash. He's a little bit vulnerable because obviously he's concentrating on this big spell. And Nagash feels the sting of fell blade upon his uh, withered bones. And the pure warp stone begins to just tear him apart, essentially. The battle between the two is pretty cataclysmic so it's you know essentially al is the last al was a great warrior as well so it's a big battle between you know a, an empowered warrior with a magic sword with a undead lich basically a D frame <laughs> shot and he also has a little bit of help from the skaven graces i think Colin, is that right they help with yeah like, they were uh, they were helping to deflect the worst of nagash's magic so they're there so he's got he's got like some fat you know cheerleaders in the back essentially helping him do it um, but essentially, Al Khazar is victorious, and he starts to hack down the bones of Nagash until they are nothing but dust. Al Khazar, unfortunately, would not survive this encounter. But with the death of Nagash, there would be some consequences to this ritual, and I think uh, Colin can take it from there just to explain what happened to the land of Nehekara after this. In, in, I, I will uh, be happy to explain. So though the, uh, the second part of his ritual, which was resurrect every corpse on the planet, did not go off, the first part went off without a hitch, and all of Nehekara, uh, as we said, died. Uh, <laughs> problem is, the, uh, I guess I shouldn't say the second part didn't completely go off, because in Nehekara, it kind of did. And though they weren't under his control, partially because the spell was unfinished and partially because he's, he's dead now, uh, the Tomb Kings rose from their graves. So those who had just died in the fighting, or just died from the spell, stood back up, the flesh still on their bodies, but hearts no longer beating. Uh, and over time, the desert winds would strip them of even that. Uh, the rest of them, even the ancient tomb kings and those dead for thousands of years, rose from their graves as skeletal legions. And the tomb kings are now officially the tomb kings. Uh, and additionally from this, outside of Nehekara, vampires and necromancy would spread across the world as those who had knowledge or wanted to gain knowledge of Nagash's power just left Nehekara and spread throughout the world. So, though he was defeated and the world saved, things aren't great, uh, especially in Nehekara. But at least for a little while, Nagash is, uh, Nagash is gone. Uh, by a little while, I mean exactly 1,111 years, uh, because his Black Pyramid was never destroyed. The Tomb Kings could never figure it out, even when Cetra came back. They'd, uh, they'd launch magic at it, they'd launch catapult ammunition at it they'd launch magical catapult ammunition at it <laughs> didn't stick just every every now and then they'd go bored and like you know, i want to take pot shots at the pyramid and uh, it'd probably be great for weapons testing uh i mean you can't blow it up so uh but uh, one 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 years later nagash has put himself back together uh over all this time uh doesn't have his the hand al are cut off that's that's gone but everything, almost everything else is back together. His armor, his staff, his sword, 
all except one thing, his crown of sorcery. And unfortunately for Nagash, that had fallen to the hands of one of the greatest men to become gods to ever live, Sigmar Unbarogan. And Nagash quite wanted that thing back. Uh, so, what he did was uh, just raise massive undead army, uh, get some vampire lieutenants, and swarm the burgeoning empire of man, wreaking havoc on it and threatening to break the unity of the tribes that Sigmar had worked so hard on fostering. Uh, the crown, because it's an evil magical crown, remember, was also corrupting Sigmar a bit, making him even more violent and bloodthirsty just as time went on. Uh, you know, he's a barbarian, you know, chief, so he's always been a uh, little, little bit of a fiend for battle. You know, he he was honorable before. He's always been a bit fighty. <laughs> yeah, he's he's always been a bit fighty, but you know, he he was he was a he was a cool guy after the fact. This is uh, post not, he. This is post he took on a dragon ogre Shagath, right? Sigmar. Yeah, like, I think he all he didn't he do one to win the loyalty of one of the tribes. I think Sigmar. I don't remember if he did a dragon ogre Shagath. I know I know how he got uh, like the land that would become Middenheim on his side. He walked into the flame of Ulrich and then caved the dude's head in, who was naysaying him. Uh, good old Sigmar. Might have been the ones I, that eventually became Null. I think it's the one with the the lady who he did, you know, basically who had his kid, if you know what I mean. I think it might be that. Maybe, he, he, maybe yeah. he had his kid. So he's he's, he's fighty. <laughs> He'll take on anything. Sigmar, the po yeah, point is Sigmar is happy to kick your ass. Uh, now he's just getting a lot more evil about it. The, the crown is like Emperor Palpatine to him in episode three. Uh, you know, so I, I shouldn't do it. Uh, that's that's <laughs> do it. That's that's Sigmar's head for a couple of years, uh, and of course, it uh, also tempts him to head southwards towards Sigmar's true master, who awaits. Uh, Sigmar eventually realizes what's happening, though, and steals himself because he still needs this crown for something. Uh, because Nagash, even while he's doing this, has not been idle. His army of the dead only grows because every time he kills someone. That's a new soldier for Nagash. And he got, he got someone real cool on his side named Krell. Uh, Hal, I know you were a fan. Do you have any, anything Krell. to say about Krell? We, I think we might, we were, because we were discussing that, we might do uh, a podcast episode on the first Warhammer character, Heinrich Kemmler, because there's quite a lot to tackle mm -hmm. there. But Krell is like an awesome undead white. And he's, he's he, compared to, he is chunk as well he's big big axe yeah. too just because we brought him up not gonna not gonna give too much away but just a, a little little background overview on him he was a cornate servant that even thousands of years before sigmar's time uh nagash raised him and then he served nagash uh because nagash has got a good eye for talent uh, for the most part mentioning no man fritz we'll save that uh so, Nagash has quite the lieutenants, that's not even counting all the vampires and other undead and white kings. And it's time for the final showdown. Uh, Sigmar's lands are being ravaged for too long, and it's he's he's not taking it anymore. And uh, Eli, I have, a, I have a quote Ooh. for you, if you wouldn't mind reading it. Yes, I'll put down my doomsday arc. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, when they met, uh, Nagash dropped this banger of a line on Sigmar. The dead do not squabble as this land's rulers do. The dead do not fight one another. The dead have no desires, no petty jealousies or ambitions. A world of the dead is a world at peace. Yeah, so uh, Nagesh, yeah, he's a, in a really twisted way, he does have a point. He's like, hey, there can't be any chaos, corruption, or infighting if everyone's a mindless zombie. Which is true. <laughs> he's not wrong. Uh, but then Sigmar immediately goes like, you know, it'd be an endless stagnation and nothing and it'd suck. And then it's time to fight. And though Sigmar is Sigmar and kick-ass, Nagash is still an undying, powerful lich. And Sigmar, even in Hell's glory, he's nearly defeated. Uh, his crown, he, Nagash's crown, he was wearing to keep the worst of Nagash's magics at bay. He, uh, he had a moment of inspiration. Uh, Nagash is an egomaniac and desperately wants to be whole again, and he needs that crown to do so. So Sigmar tosses the uh, the crown onto the ground, and Nagash, in just a complete moment of greed and desire to be whole again, Nagash lunges for it, an opening just long enough for Sigmar to bring the hammer down on him, as it were. Uh, and Galmaraz claims another victim, and because Nagash is gone, his undead army begins to crumble, and the vampires begin freeing. 
or fleeing, not freeing. <laughs> uh, this is also where the vampires get all their weaknesses because some of them were perhaps a little bit slow in helping the gash. You know, they could, they maybe they could have done a better, a uh, little bit better job of it. And so Nagash has cursed all of them with the weaknesses vampires traditionally have. Uh, they used to, like, uh, for example, they used to be able to go in sunlight, no problem. Now it burns them. Uh, you know, uh, like there's a, they used to not, you know, there's like the whole thing, vampires can't cross running water. Nagash did that, and just really whatever he thought of, uh, he just cursed them to be weak to that, because he is a heady prick. Uh, as well as a weakness to holy symbols, which in this case means anything to do with Sigmar. Because, yeah, again, vengeful, petty child that unfortunately is powerful than most gods. He's a little bit like, I always thought of him as like a cross between what is Joffrey and what is Tywin Lannister, where he he has a little bit of the cunning of Tywin Lannister, but he has all the petulance of Joffrey, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah he's, uh, he's, he's an odd mixture of incredibly smart and powerful and incredibly stupid. Uh, but hey, it's, it's fun to watch him do his thing. What can I say? Uh, and there are two more occasions in Warhammer Fantasy... Three more, pardon me, actually. Where something of Nagash's is rather plot relevant. So, the next time is his final resurrection before the end times, called the Night of the Living Dead. Where he just comes back for a bit. Uh, the dead across the world rose, vampires swarm the living... Uh, but he's so weakened after all this time that after that night, like no one even killed. He just he just fades away back in the afterlife. He just pieces out. Uh, old lore or newer lore says that it's because the fell blade was so horrible that it weakens him even in death. Older lore says that the people he killed just ganged up on him and beat the snot out of him every time he died. So that's why he comes back weaker. Which I like to imagine it's both, and he definitely has it coming. Uh, but. Either way, that's the Night of the Living Dead. Not, you know, scary while it was happening. Not exactly very consequential. Uh, going forward, Arkin continues to find ways to resurrect him, and Manfred von Karstein even enters his services. God, Manfred, Arkin, is, Arkin is just the boy. He is like... He is, he is the MVP. <laughs> he is the most loyal... Like, he's literally loyal for thousands of years that day. He doesn't falter once. <laughs> just also, like, he's on it. Also have noticed that uh, Nagash kicked him in a pit of maggots that ate his flesh once, and because Arkin took the elixir of immortality, he couldn't die. Uh, so, he's loyal to Nagash despite being treated like Garbo. Damn. Gotta, fi gotta find a better master. Uh, Manfred, by the way, plans on absorbing Nagash's power once he's back, because he's Manfred and does not know what loyalty <laughs> means. But, uh, it doesn't matter, because for a while, that's kinda just how things roll. Uh, the second time something important happens with Nagash is once again his crown. So one day, uh, there was an orc warlord named Azag of a small little band of orcs, nothing too special, that was forced into some ancient ruins by a band of chaos warriors. And Azag finds what else but that damn crown of sorcery that keeps popping up all over the place. He puts it on and suddenly goes from you know, an orc to a master strategist who's pretty good at throwing Wind of Death magic spells around as well. Uh, it also gives him schizophrenia. Uh, <laughs> the Nagash's voice keeps trying to tell him to go south so he can resurrect himself again. Uh, the orcs under Azag don't really care because he keeps leading them to fights. He just they, he just says they're, Azag's a bit eccentric. So he's a bit weird, talks to himself sometimes, but we don't mind. Uh, and then it comes to a head... When Nagash attempts to assume direct control over Azag because that damn orc won't just go south already. And while there's this little mental battle going on, an Imperial Knight kills Azag, and that's the end of that little story. Oh, uh, Nagash, has, <laughs> Nagash has to go back to waiting for Arkin to do stuff again. I love the fact that Nagash is like, oh, someone's found my crown, and then he's like, oh my god, it's an <laughs> orc, and he's just <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 this way, this way, and he's just, the orc's like, huh? Oh, a battle! <laughs> it's just like it's pretty, it's pretty much what it was. Like you just wander around the empire and like Kislev ransacking it, and, and like it's dwarf holes. The ones you get. Actually, I have a, qu <laughs> a quick question for Eli because obviously, forty k wise, you're like, if the emperor gets crowned, you'd be like, oh, uh, you know, the bad guys win. You'd love it. In Warhammer Fantasy, do you feel the same way? Like, if say like Nagash or the Skaven like take over, are you like happy about that? 
Or is that just? Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be rooting for them. I'd more be rooting for the Archeon or uh, Grimgore Ironhead. Uh, the one true get. Yep. I, I I do like the Empire a lot in fantasy though, and Bretonia. Well, just uh, just not so in forty k. I, <laughs> I just like I just like playing the bad guy. I don't know. I like playing the bad guy in games. That's why something's wrong with me. I don't know. Skaven, look, the surface world belongs to the the Skaven. Mm. So, I, so much has been discussed. I think Norska, it'd be cool to see Norska win, actually. <laughs> well, I have good news for you. <laughs> <laughs> You're jumping ahead in the story too much. <laughs> nice. Uh, the the final time before we get to the end times, because uh, for a while, Nagash is dead, dead. al are and the Fellblade really made him stick. And then Sigmar really drove the nail in the coffin. Was when one of his artifacts features and where else but Gotrick and Felix. Hey. Uh, the, the Eye of Kemri, it's called, where uh, the wizard Max Schreiber, he's a he's a real cool dude in the Gotcha and Felix books. He is a G. Uh, finds this, he's like, hmm, what, what is this thing? I, I don't know what this is. It's, it's ancient. It's Kemrian. I wonder what it is. And then he starts unraveling it, and then a gaseous spirit jump scares him, and he, he kind of <laughs> loses consciousness for like a week. Isn't that like a like a, a cliche of just like, oh, I found a mysterious artifact of unknown origin. I'm gonna mess with it. It's like, don't do that. It doesn't end well ever. To be yeah. fair, Max is the kind of guy where like he could usually like if it was only if it wasn't a gash, like he could handle it. But it was just like he, he's already a pretty powerful wizard, isn't he, Max? Oh yeah. Like the fact that he didn't just get his brain exploded is unbelievably impressive. That'd be like if some random like Imperial Guard psyker found the book of Magnus and was just like, Alright. <laughs> my head hurts a bit, but I'm fine. Uh, so they find that Eye of Kemri. Uh, a vampire wants to use it to take over the world. He's in a Gotrick and Felix book, so you can probably guess how that comes <laughs> out. Uh, shout out to shout out to Snorri Nosebiter, who's also in that book. Cannot Snorri. let a single mention of him go. And uh, it's not the sad Snorri moment, so that's all right. It's a it's a happy read. <laughs> and uh, then for a while, that's uh, kind of it for Nagash. Uh, he indirectly guides the undead from the afterlife to allow for his resurrection, and he rather more directly guides Arcan in particular to lead to his resurrection. Uh, Manfred too, but Manfred's Manfred and an asshole. So, uh, and in the meantime, the the world moves on. The Empire grows in power. The Tomb Kings are always preparing for his next return and attempting to find ways to finally destroy his Black Pyramid. And the vampires every now and then decide to show chaos how to be properly villainous. Uh, thank you, Nagash, for that endless thorn in the Empire side that is Sylvania. Uh, of note, and this is going to become plot relevant very soon, is that even the ancient hatred of the dwarfs and the high elves, you know, with the War of the Beard from Nagash's time, even that's beginning to wane. Uh, Phoenix King Finnabar the Seafarer, the rightful Phoenix King Finnabar, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, is allowed into dwarf holds and the capital of Karazak Harak on a diplomatic mission. He tries Bugman's Ale, unheard of for elves. Uh, the best the best alcoholic drink ever created. Did he like it? Uh, it doesn't say. I'm guessing he liked it, because Bugman's Ale is like described as the beverage of the gods. <laughs> so, I'm sure he did. It's out or cough afterwards, like, yeah, he did fine. <laughs> uh, it also is like instant, makes you drunk, so... I think you can actually get it in the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay character. Yeah. Mm. Or game, uh, you're not allowed to make a con save or whatever the equivalent is to not be drunk. Oh, you are yeah. now drunk. Fun. So shout out to Bugmans. Uh, and even more noteworthy than that is uh, Hal. I hope you're ready. Oh God, <laughs> the, the, I hate to talk about the, this guy. <laughs> the Ever Child Aliathra, uh, the daughter of the Ever Queen. She is important because she will inherit the composite soul of the Ever Queen and the power of Isha when the current one dies. And she's uh, she's also on a diplomatic tour of the dwarf holds and the dwarfs love her because uh, she's just like the, I don't know, like the yeah she she's she's like Galadriel if she was I don't know not like Old. ancient and unbelievably powerful she's like an adorable little Galadriel uh, dwarf dwarves love her elves love her uh, Alario loves her because it's her daughter Tyrion definitely loves her because it's uh, it's his daughter. And uh, he would he would be very angry if something bad were to happen to her. Uh, <laughs> uh oh, Manfred von Karstein is here. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 
what happens. How? Oh god, this is the this is the guy I don't want to yeah. talk about. So this, this is the oh, here goes Manfred. Man. Okay, so it would actually be in the year of uh twenty five twenty four. I think if you're playing the uh Total War games, I think it's set how many years before? I think they're twenty five. Um, I, I think they 20? started like twenty five seventeen. I have in my head. Yeah, so this is this is a few years towards that uh, time. There's a few years in after that time. I'm just it's like it's it's like turned thirty in a Total War game. Yeah, mm-hmm. just for like the Total War uh, players out there for reference. And unfortunately, Arkan the Black, along with the aid of Manfred von Karstein, the the guy who killed the setting. Uh, I have a little tidbit earlier. The Ark in the Black has previously, I think, killed Heinrich Kemmler at this point as well. In, and, indeed, which is uh, yeah. very sad. But you know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of people going into this. You'll see what's about to happen. And with the aid of Manfred von Karst, and they begin the resurrection of Nagash. So they collect many of the uh, old uh, necromancers' um, artifacts and. All the little pieces and uh, sacrifices. Hand. The hand, they have his armor as well. They also kidnap some people along with it, who I'm just about to... The people who are the uh, ingredients, shall we say. Nagash hasn't been able to fully resurrect. Uh, we did previously mention there was that the uh, the night where he resurrected for a day, but clearly he didn't have the strength to fully resurrect, so Arkan basically <laughs> needed to... Give him, you know, you need to give him like a blue pill and you know, get it up, soldier. Oh, no. <laughs> so uh, sorry, I, <laughs> but, uh, I, I, my brain, my brain said premature resurrection. I, I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so that, that was when he was fighting Sigmar. <laughs> <laughs> Who can blame him? So they gather some of these ingredients, shall we say? They even kidnap um, the Ever Child. There's actually a quite cool part where the dwarves are, I think, escorting. Her and the doors are like, and elves are marching together, and then they get attacked by Manfred. And it's like a cool scene where the elves and um, dwarves like fight by each other's side, but it's not enough, unfortunately. They also kidnap, um, is it Morgiana or Le Fay? I think that's the Lady of the Lake, or well, not the actual no, lady, but the, the avatar the of the. Felon Chantress, her voice in the mortal mortal world. Yeah, so the, the avatar of the Lady of the Lake from Bretonia. Soon to be dead, Bretonian. Good, good man. A good Bretonian. A um, little bit of a. So they begin this uh, sacrifice ritual. Uh, Manfred and Arkan. They, uh, the, the the lady is essentially cut open, and her essence, shall we say, is used to fill a cauldron. They also have the uh, defiant Volkmar the Grim, who is the. What was his exact title again in the um, uh, Archlector, I believe. Archlector, so he's, he's, kind the, of he's the, the Pope of Sigmar. He's the Pope. He has that warpstone like chess piece, which is kind of badass. But also, like, how is he not cooked from that? Because he's, he's just built different. <laughs> he's also been kidnapped. He is Aww. essentially encased in Nagash's like old armor, and he's just like tied up there. Um, and they also, unfortunately, have the ever child uh, Alithiar, Alith, Alith- Aliathra, Aliathra. No, my bad, Aliathra. She is obviously not happy about this. Uh, not happy is doesn't even cut it. And she is kind of the last uh, piece of the ritual. The ritual itself was called the Death at Nine Demons, which is actually a pretty badass name. But this was not. Uh, it didn't go smoothly. It was interrupted by a high elven force, one that has a particularly mighty elven hero who would make his way towards the ritual site along with his forces, and he would attempt to interrupt it. His name is Altharion the Grim, and I'll hand it over to Colin because there's no way I'm not letting Colin talk about I this main love man. love Altharion. Oh, my God. Uh, so Altharion the Grim. A uh, little backstory on him because, well, he's, he's earned it. Is uh he's high elf Batman. Uh, he invaded the dark elf homeland, nearly took them out, until a fat goblin was threatening to destroy his home of Yvres <laughs> and the world. Uh, uh, Grom the Paunch, the 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 fattest gobble of them all. Can we, can uh, we explain and, why he's fat very quickly? Because that has to oh, be yeah. said. Oh yeah, because because Grom ate troll meat, which usually it's regenerative, so the orcs would force feed goblins to eat it and then watch them explode. Yes. 
Uh, Grom just kept growing alongside the troll meat, though. He's also built different. Uh, so he nearly took out Altharian's home. And Altharian swooped home, killed Grom, stopped the world from ending by stabilizing the, the vortex. And proceeded to kill so many orcs that he single-handedly gave elves a reputation for being the best fighters on the planet in the eyes of the orcs. Uh, given this man backstory here, because he, he has a fate that's not great coming up soon. Uh, he's also High Elf Batman, uh, if you, especially if you, you've you seen the, the Warden and the Paunch trailer, where he has his bat cave, he locks up goblins <laughs> inside of <laughs> him. Uh, so he shows up leading the army of high elves, you know, where is she? Uh, <laughs> looking for Aliathra. And he sees Ark in the Black inside of a magical force field preparing to cast the ritual. And he goes, uh, he proceeds to d try and, er, no, pardon me, I'm getting ahead of myself. He takes his magical sword, the fang sword, and breaks it in order to bypass the force field, which he does. And in true Batman fashion, he does to Arkin what Batman does to Jay Walkers in Gotham. Grabs him by the throat and begins just slamming his head into the ground. Uh, which, very awesome. Except Arkin is a lot better of a wizard than he is. So Arkin, uh, in spite of Altharian's wonderful performance and just badassery, casts the Curse of Years spell, and in a matter of moments, Altharian ages to dust. Dang. Oh, man. Which, uh, he put up one hell of a fight, though. Uh, also, I, I should be uh, summing up Aliathra. Manfred kept trying to taunt her about her upcoming death and horrible pain she'd go through, and she just kind of looked at him, just completely nonplussed. Which uh, Ark in the Black was like, you know what? Good on you, Aliathra. I'm still gonna kill you because I need your, I need you for this. Uh, but good on you for making Manfred look like a clown. <laughs> and uh, Hal, would you like to? I'll finish, finish it off. Finish the, the tragedy. Uh, well. Unfortunately, the High Elf force didn't make it in time, and the Everchild was killed by Arkan. It's a pretty grim part, so we can't obviously go into too much detail because YouTube, but essentially the ritual with the last piece in place starts to enact. You know, violent, turbulent winds uh, come abound. The whole place starts to storm, and then Arkan then cleaves off Volksmar's wrist and places the severed hand that uh, Colin mentioned earlier that al Kadizar managed to uh, crunk off um, Nagash quite a few thousand years ago at this point. And he places it upon that stump. And then essentially Volkmar is uh, encased in the um, Nagash's armor. He's basically consumed by this vortex and dark magic. And then such is the power of Nagash... Nagash is fully reborn. The skeleton bone daddy emerges back into the mortal uh, plane and he's essentially ready to uh, <laughs> begin Nagashing all over the entire setting. Oh yeah, he's uh, he is back for real this time. And uh, it should be noted that in Warhammer Fantasy prior, you know, prior to the end times, uh, Nagash's return was is treated with the same level of terror that the chaos gods themselves walking onto the mortal plane is. Uh, and now he's back fully. He's back. Uh, Naga uh, Manfred, like I was saying, thought he's like, I'm going to steal Nagash's power when he's back and become the ultimate death, uh, you know, magician. Manfred's terrified. He, uh, he realized that his plan was like the equivalent of setting off a nuclear bomb to power your house forever. Uh, it's uh, Manfred's way over, you know, over his head. Nagash's power is completely unrivaled. His arrogance is finally put in check, isn't it? Yeah, Manfred is finally learning his place in the world. Uh, and it's uh, that being said, there is one issue with Nagash's resurrection. Uh, part of the reason Aliathra was chosen and not any other elf is because she's the Everchild, and Nagash wanted the power of Isha and the Everqueen. Problem is, until the last Everqueen dies, the the Everchild is just a fancy title. It's it's like a IOU one godlike power coupon. <laughs> uh, what Aliathra does have in her is the Curse of Cain because she's Tyrion's kid. Nice. So instead of gaining you know unlimited power over life and death, Nagash is just Nagash just really wants to pick up the sword of Cain. That's that's <laughs> really all he got out of the deal. <laughs> he got cursed. 
Uh, but he's still not a, uh, he's still back at full power and then some regardless. So he's uh he's powerful. Oh, uh, the vampire Neferata also knew about this and thought it was funny and didn't tell anyone what would happen with Aliathra, which I think is pretty funny. She's like, nice. yeah, you're a bunch of idiots. Nice. Uh, now, Nagash is back, and the first book of the End Times is all about him. It's called Nagash. So it's time for step one of Nagash's master plan, Obliterate Nehekara, which he promptly does. He has Arkin invade the city of Kemri, which fares fair to the Tomb Kings. They defeat it reasonably easily, uh, but it was all a ploy, because Nagash hid inside of Arkin's body. Don't, don't ask. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It just... Arkin gets cut in half and Nagash pops out. Uh, Nagash then duels Setra, who, despite Setra only being like an okay wizard and the size of a normal person, compared to Nagash, who is the incarnate of death magic and the size of a titan, Setra drifts around him and ties him at a Dragon Ball Z beam duel. Uh, Setra says the cool line, Setra does not serve. Setra does explode, however, because Nagash is done with his crap. And Kemri is completely obliterated down to the sand it's resting on. We should also mention all a lot of the undead like characters within the Warhammer verse. They essentially flock to Nagash's side and they become his. I think his Mortarks, right? Mortarks, yeah. Which are like uh, the generals. Vlad von Karstein, Manfred, uh, Neferata, Krell. Good old Krell's back at it again Krell. after Heinrich Heinrich got obliterated by Arkin. Uh, Luther, Harkon, Vampire Jack Sparrow's here to join the party. Uh, and of no, special note for those of you familiar with him, one fella named Drakenfels, uh, referred to as the Nameless, who is a uh, an old lore character they brought back for as a fun little cameo in the end times as one of Nagash's chief servants. What happens to what happens to Conrad? Is that his name the Schizo Vampire? I have no idea what happens <laughs> to him in the end times. To be entirely honest, I like him. He's funny. Will he be part uh, of the, you know how they're bringing fancy back? Will his plot be part of what they tackle, do you reckon, with the three emperors? Uh, was that earlier? I can't remember. I honestly, I'm not too familiar on my on my Conrad von Karstein lore. I have his mini, uh, so I hope they do. <laughs> psycho. Absolute he's psychopath. Got cool, he's got a cool mini, so I hope he comes back. <laughs> but uh, I don't, I, don't, I don't think he's involved in the end times. He can't cast spells, so I mean... No, but he can rip you in half True. quite easily. Because <laughs> uh, my my knowledge of him is vague, but I know you said like he's kind of like been through a bit of mental trauma at this point. I just like the idea of him being in the battlefield at the end times, going, "Has anyone seen my keys? I need my keys. I don't know where I am. What's going on?" And then like they just forget he's there, and then he just wanders off. And anyone who gets in his way just rips apart, and he goes, "I'm, I'm sure I put them somewhere. They're somewhere around here." And then he just disappears. Poor guy. While all the mayhem's going on, cuts he's man by all the other vampires. Cuts <laughs> cuts a man in half and says, "I forgot to take out the bins." And he's just in like, <laughs> <laughs> "Did I leave the stove on?" Uh, I'm going back and going to <laughs> sheer panic. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, poor uh, poor Conrad and poor Nahekara. I said that weird. Anyways, <laughs> uh, the rest of the to- most of the rest of the Tomb Kings and Undead are now under his control from here on out, with two exceptions. One is a singular Tomb King who, even after Setra was defeated and the rest of Nehekara was put under Nagash's heel, he still neg- uh, defied Nagash's will and was nevertheless defeated. I could not find this Tomb King's name. I believe he was from the city of Zandri. So if you know it, please put in the comments or the live chat or something, please. Uh, but shout out to that guy. He was a, he was a, real, he was a real one. The second exception was a vampire named Zacharias the Ever-Living, who I'm bringing up because he's, this is very funny. Uh, he used to have rules and was in a model, and he was built up as equal to Nagash in power, or at least almost equal. Uh, Nagash comes back, and uh, as he's contacting everyone, he contacts Zacharias and is like, Hey, you're a vampire, why don't you, you know, get on over here, serve me now. Uh, Zacharias demands to be treated as an equal and refuses Nagash's summons, saying, I'm just as powerful as you. So Nagash sets his brain on fire. Oh. Uh, that went well, it turned, didn't it? As it turns out, Zacharias was not the equal to Nagash. Uh, rest, rest in piss. Uh, after this, he consumes the Nehekaran god of the dead, Usirian, and the power of the dwarf, dwarf ancestor goddess of Elia. So Nagash has now eaten two gods. 
uh, and most of the wind of death. Oh, he's he, getting a taste for it now. He's like, oh, this is quite nice, actually. I'm oh, yeah. More gods. Why not? Now it's time for phase two. Uh, get the rest of the Mortarks together and turn the pyramid into a spaceship. So he lifts his black pyramid off the ground and floats it over to Sylvania to bind the entire wind of death to the province. Which, imagine floating the pyramids of Giza all the way to Romania, is what Nagash just did. Uh, that's just how he rolls. Uh, so Nurgle and the Skaven, because the Chaos Gods themselves are afraid of Nagash, because if he wins, he's going to turn Chaos into Nagash land. They see him as like a potential rival. That's what... Yeah. Uh, but just like as a reference to people who are just um, like 40k or uh, 30k viewers, the Chaos Gods in Warhammer Fantasy are powerful, but they're not quite to the level of what the 40k slash 30k ones, I think, are. They're a bit more uh, tangible, if you know what I mean. I think that's this right. This is a matter of the setting is just one planet, so obviously they can't be destroying planets left and right. Uh, but nevertheless, Nagash has big plans. So, uh, with this, the Nurgles... The Nurgles? The Nurgle <laughs> the, forces. The band, the Nurgles. <laughs> the Nurgles. It's a TV show. It's like, let's go and check in with the Nurgles. And they're just like, it's Mummy Nurgle. Hello. Just like, oh, no. This show's like the diarrhea. The family on television. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, Nurgle and the Skaven, uh, who are now part of Chaos because the end times need to happen, uh, get wind of this and go to stop him. Nagash and his forces hold off Nurgle with no problem. But the Skaven brought this goofy little thing we like to call a tactical nuclear warhead to the fight and blew up the Black Pyramid from underneath it, which they when they tunneled under it. Truly goofy. Uh, a little bit of a prank, if you will, pulling on Nagash. Prank him, John. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> uh, you already know. You already know. <laughs> uh, now, with true godhood and dominion over everything out of his reach, he throws a hissy fit unleashes a magical brass blast which perma kills every demon present and takes stock of where he's at uh and he's a uh, it's time for him to go to plan b now earlier in the end times uh teclas uh had given him an offer suggesting he allies with the living uh some imperial diplomats gave him the same offer and he killed them and he told teclas to go away but now with him being fresh out of options to defeat Chaos. It's time for him to suck it up. So, what he does is, uh, he goes to the Wood Elf home of Athel Lauren, where at this point, all of the uh, incarnates, like the, the good guys coming together, the Avengers, are located, trying to figure out what to do. And is like, alright, I'll play ball now, I'll, I'll be your allies. Uh, of note is that Malekith, who once again is responsible for all of the world's problems, uh, <laughs> says this is the worst idea you've ever had Teclas what the hell are you doing uh which and I, as much as i think he's a he's a bit of a jerk i i can't fault Malekith on this one uh, there's also a bit where Teclas he's got like magic vision uh he sees the demons as pure black cuz you know they're they're per, they're they're demons they're pure evil nagash is just about as dark as they are mm. uh so he's he's as evil as demons <laughs> Which uh, I thought was cool. But he's real. That's even worse. He is, yeah. Nagash, Nagash doesn't go away if you, like, ignore magic for long enough. Nagash is going to make you his problem. Make him your problem. Because demons are just, they're just magic. Or, like, they're essentially sentient nightmare given yeah, form. They, they need, they need met. They're, like, they're formed out of magic. So if magic isn't strong in an area, they physically cannot be demons. Nagash isn't like that. Nagash will just make himself your problem. Uh, so, uh, despite, you know, he shows up to Athel Lauren, uh, Wood Elf home, and despite him showing up and constantly taunting Ali or Alariel and Tyrion about how his, their daughter died to let him come back, uh, an alliance is formed between God, the guests. He is the them. worst. Yeah. He really is just the worst. <laughs> Although as, as a little, like a, a truce gift, he gives the Manfred von Karstein to be a prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> which even Manfred's like, hang on, wait a minute, I didn't agree to this, and then he's just like, put, he's just put in a box, uh, which I wish he stayed in that box. Yep. Uh, chaos invades to keep them from interfering or interfering. Uh, Nagash soul is a bloodthirster, uh, with I might add, not even a fraction of the effort it took Sanguinius. Uh, simply built better. You leave my beautiful boy alone. He's uh, brilliant. 
Yeah, well, the Bone Man did far better. And the Bone Man died and still did it. Sanguinius died, and what's he doing? He's dead. Dang, Skill issue. Symbol of everything that's lovely about men <laughs> with wings. I don't know. He's lovely. Sanguinala is only six months away. Think of the children. And in the, the words, in the words of Nagash, skill issue. <laughs> yeah. uh, after this happens, Teclas teleports everyone to the city of Middenheim, where Archeon is performing a ritual to open a great warp rift, which will swallow the world whole into chaos. Uh, everyone starts fighting. Nagash starts soloing more bloodthirsters and really just killing anything that gets in his way. Just anything that gets in his way is swiftly unmade. Uh, zombies are everywhere, elves are everywhere, orcs are everywhere, it's a massive fight. Uh, complete cluster, just fuster cluck. <laughs> uh, Cetra shows back up and tells Nagesh that after he kills all four of the Chaos Gods, he's coming for Nagesh next, which... By God, I wish I could have Cetra's confidence in my <laughs> life. Uh, and uh, the Ar Incarnates of the Lores of Magic start performing their ritual to stave off the end of the world. Manfred, who had broken free, did his funny thing where he stabs Gelt in the back. And the last yeah. of Nagash in Warhammer Fantasy is him crumbling to dust and panicking as chaos consumes the world. Thank you, Manfred. Thank you, Games Workshop. Very cool. Oh, gosh. They could have written it any other way. Yeah. Uh, that's how they chose to do it. Uh, that's how they chose to do it. What um, was Manfred's reasoning? Well, uh, I remember, it wasn't he figured cool. now was the time to take power and betray Nagash so he'd be on the winning side. <laughs> Except oh, I think he'd... I, I, I don't know. His his reasoning was, I'm Manfred von Karstein and I haven't filled my treachery code over no, the day. No. They fumbled so many endings in the end times. Obviously, that's the worst one, but... Jeez, Very, <laughs> at least Grimgore beats up Archeon. He does do that. Oh, man, I can't... <laughs> Uh, but not to be sad for too long because Nagash comes back in the Age of Sigmar. He's uh, he's the great necromancer. It's kind of hard to get rid of him. Fair. Uh, so what the Chaos Gods did with him in the meantime is uh, just lock him in a crypt of forgotten moments. I don't know what that means, <laughs> uh, but it's what they locked him in until Sigmar frees him. Because uh, Sigmar in the early days of the Mortal Realms needs some powerful allies. How does Sigmar survive? Uh, he, so in the, during the end times, him and Archeon are wrestling over Galmaraz, and they're the first to fall into the Chaos Rift. Uh, Sigmar survives, he gets Galmaraz back, but he survives by just hanging on to the floating core of the Warhammer world. Uh, oh, as as you Sigmar, do. How does Sigmar show up? Does he just show up through Karl Franz, or is he just there? When uh when Teclas unbinds the winds of magic from the vortex, uh, he notes that the wind of Azir heavens had a mind inside of it, and it turns out that Zinch locked him inside of it, uh, and uh, so that's how Sigmar attained true godhood, and uh, enough to survive the world blowing up. Uh, good for him. Uh, so Sigmar finds Nagash, frees him, and together they fight and slay beings that are just straight up said to be able to give the Chaos Gods a run for their money. So Sigmar is uh, a Nagash, quite a bit stronger. Uh, they, I guess, Nagash did, did a whole lot of sit-ups in the in the <laughs> in the interim. Also, a small I tidbit just... as well. They say, I think it's implied as well, when now that they're gods, that the previous like gods of the other worlds, or like the the world that was, they were people who survived like the previous destruction of the last world. So that's how like Cain and Assyrian may have come. Yeah, it's uh, that's. One of the things they reveal, like it's survivors of the previous epoch of the, like the previous world. Although Gork and Mork are kind of throw a wrench in that because Gork and Mork are just they're just Gork and Mork again. They're back. I nice. I just I just like how you were like oh you know Nagash and Sigmar team up like a buddy cop movie. It's like good cop bad cop, and they're like we're gonna take care and get all the trash. And I mean, Nagash is the one who's like <laughs> he's really not wrong. And <laughs> what it was. <laughs> I would kill to see a comic about that. <laughs> uh, there's uh, As they find more of the survivors of the Warhammer world who become the new gods, uh, Nagash sets up shop in the realm of Shyesh, Death, which is where the various afterlives of the Age of Sigmar universe all, all live in merry harmony with each other. Uh, despite him not having any greater claim to it than all of the other Death gods that exist, 
Nagesh declares that he is now the god of death. There will only be one. And in order to make sure of this, he absorbs all the other death gods until he is the only one left. Because he, he, he learned nothing and he is still the worst. And when you're a tyrant, you get to rewrite your own uh, past to your fitting and go, no, I was always the, the one who was in charge of death. Yeah, that's my thing. Yep. Oh, what other gods? Yum, yum, yum. Tasty. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he's, he's, the, he's the guy for death now. Uh, although, interestingly enough, for, for a few thousand years, he doesn't betray anyone. Uh, he plans to, but he doesn't do it quite yet. And even more interestingly, uh, Sigmar considered Nagash his closest ally in this time, the Age of Myth, it's called. Uh, so I guess Nagash can behave, even if it's just so it's all the more of a gut punch when he betrays you later. But, you know, he was behaving for a while. Uh, Marathi tried to seduce him. I don't, I don't know what she thought she was going to do with him. He's a skeleton, but, you know, she tried. And then Nagash slapped her so hard that she turned into a snake. <laughs> Whoa, that's weird. Yeah, that's, yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's a weird sentence, to be honest. <laughs> it's, it's her true form. He slapped her so hard, her, like, illusion wore off. Uh, but, you know, Nagash has quite the backhand, apparently. I also like how Sigmar probably thinks he's very close, or that he's his best ally, just because... Nagash is like a known quantity. Like he knows what Nagash wants, so therefore he knows how to act with him. Around it. Whereas like people like Teclas or Malekith, or sorry, what's not Malik? What's he called now? Malarian, but I'm Malaria, going to call him yeah. Malekith. Malekith. Malaria. Like, Malarian. <laughs> it's it's pretty close, brothers. But I think they yeah. are like he, <laughs> it's hard to gauge what the other gods plan to do, especially like something much more conniving. And Nagash is like, oh, I know he's going to betray me at some point, but I just know as long as like his interests are aligned with mine, we're good. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So Nagash, is, uh, he starts getting to work, making his undead forces and all that good stuff. Uh, Ark in the Black is back. Once again, Nagash is chief right-hand man. And he acts so personality-less that people forget he's not just a neutral avatar of Nagash, including Nagash sometimes. <laughs> Uh, he is. He does still have like he is still a character, but he puts on an, an appearance to let him avoid all of the politicking the forces of the undead do. Uh, the vampires. He brings back vampires and Arcanax so bland because the vampires have such dynastic politics going on that it makes Game of Thrones look tame. And Manfred von Karstein is back, baby. Uh, to be Nagash's to be Nagash's little stress ball. Hey. So Vlad's lining. still dead in the in Age of Sigmar. Vlad tragically is not back. Yeah, it's oh, very upsetting. Cringe. I'm okay with that though. I'm I feel like he doesn't like he just to feel spoilers because I don't know if we will talk about him sometime. But I feel like he's hit the right end of his story yeah. arc with how he met his end, shall we say? So I feel like it's they should the leave him alone. Best vampire. It doesn't just bring everyone back in Age of Sigmar. Some people, bring back Cetra. Bring back that, Cetra. Cetra should come back. That's one of the ones like he's he's he he's not done yet. Mm -hmm. Is Krell even back? I don't think Krell has a cool model. No. What the heck? Him, Why not? Kim and Kemmler's model used to be on the store. They were taken down not actually that long ago, like a couple months, I think. And I regret not getting them so much. I have an old Krell one, but he's like missing pieces and broken now. So oh. it's like, it feels so bad. Pain. Big Maybe shame. when Old World comes out, they might re-release them. Here's hoping. Uh, but yeah, for a while, Nagash was doing his thing. And then Chaos shows up. Uh, Nagash is, interestingly, the last one like of the gods that leaves to do their own thing. He's the last one to stick by Sigmar's side. Unsurprisingly, he basically kicks Sigmar and his forces on the balls on the way out and leaves them to rot before the biggest battle of the war. So... Sigmar, it's called the Battle of the Burning Skies. It is an epic fantasy battle against Archaon and all the Chaos Gods. Sigmar loses because he got tricked into throwing his scammer, Galmaraz, away. He retreats back to his homeland, home realm of Azir, to create the Stormcast Eternals. And, uh, Hal, why don't you let us know how things go for Nagash from here? Oh, this is, this is goofy. So, uh, Nagash has done his event you know he waited a, he, it was cooking you know people were like let him cook let him cook but um eventually he did betray sigma and even 
uh, at this point as well, he does battle Archeon as well. Squad is Archeon is back, baby. Uh, he's even better than ever. And uh, Nagash does find that he is crunked by <laughs> Archeon at some point. He, th- he arrogantly again thinks that he could take on Sigma and the Chaos Gods, as is like the rise of the uh, Age of Chaos. Didn't go to plan. So he decided to do his next best thing as like a... You know, you can't put Nagash down. He's now like the god of death. He's not he's not ever dying, like truly. At least until the plot demands it. Um, but so he begins his new plan of once again forming black pyramids. So he would send out minions to resource the what's called Shaishian realm stone, or which is like a it's like a sand that they would turn to something called shade glass which is a bit different to how he built the pyramids in the one of the fancy worlds. That's like a mix of implied, like there's like some warp stone to that. Whereas this is warp warp stone and black marble. Well, this one is more like um, the actual sand, like the realm itself that's turned into like a specific glass. Although weirdly enough, these pyramids, he's like, he makes a few black pyramids and they're upside (laughs) down. He doesn't stop at one this time. No, he's like, I got, I got backup plans on backup plans. And he makes them, yeah, they're floating, but they're upside down, which is, you think... <laughs> he can't dig under this one, Skaven. <laughs> yeah, you, <probably laughs> thought, you, can't, you can't create this one, surely. And with these black pyramids, he will once again try to funnel uh, magical power into himself and again cast a spell that would end all life across the realms um, because he just, you know, if the idea's not broke, don't fix it, just execution. Uh, he's, he's about to get prank fooled. About to get pranked again. <laughs> of course, no one was happy with this. Chaos even sent armies to attempt to interrupt the ritual. I, even, I think I even believe like some of the forces of Sigma tried as well. But it would be once again the Skaven Rat mm. Boys gang gang. They would they would <laughs> once again thwart your boy. Um, do they actually? I think they mine into it I, from. The realm of is it they mine in from Skaven Blight? I can't remember. Well, yeah, because they can tunnel in between reality now. Uh, <laughs> just like not even like there's the realm gates, not even like that. They just tunnel between reality and they can pop up wherever they want. Uh, so they do that and dig into his pyramids uh, and uh, do a funny little prank we like to call multiple tactical nukes. Yes, <laughs> they even to be fair, they actually tend to mine. At the pyramid as well, so they, so they didn't just blow it up. They also attempted to steal some of it, but also the fact of them being present in the pyramids, like just because they are like tainted by chaos, they just their very presence kind of would start to ruin the ritual, and it would start to twist and convulse. And eventually, shout this would to, okay. Sorry, shout out to my boy Douglas MacArthur. The Skaven are a big fan of his uh, problem solving methods. <laughs> Eventually, warheads. God. Sorry, sorry. They eventually do disrupt the spell, and they also, as Colin said, they start. You know, they give it boom, boom, funny time, and it, you know, it blows up. <laughs> they this does because uh, the amount of magical power that is both the realm of Shayish as mean. Uh, check out if you want to see more about Age of Sigma on our uh, Fireside Fantasy, where we did like a full in depth of like if you're new to it, and then you know, Colin like kind of held my hand through that. Uh, the realm of Shaiish is pretty big. Like these realms are unending, but this spell would send a shockwave that would blast not even just across that realm of death. It would go to all the other realms who are kind of not necessarily. It's not like a planet, but they're also in a way. I think we said in that video, didn't we? Like, like Thor the Dark World, where like they kind of tunnels and things and gates that connect them. They kind of like overlap on each other. This spell would go basically wrong and it would spawn something called the Necroquake, which was essentially an undead wave that washed over all of the realms. And this death magic would start to essentially arise the dead. Although many of the dead and like Asian mother, their souls go to the realm of Shayish. There are still obviously like skeletons and, you know, people buried in other realms. And this would basically raise the dead across all like all at once, and everyone's like, "Oh my god!" They would obviously cities would be overrun, many people would die. 
again, it's not necessarily all under Nagash's control, but he did get a bit of a bonus from the ritual. So he did uh, find like a sort of, described like an eldritch portal or a kind of concentration of the magic he had already gathered. And he absorbed as much of this as he could. So he did get a bit of a power up. But the also slight consequence of this as well would be for the later uh, stories of Age of Sigmar, which is the god beasts, which are like titanic creatures and things I think similar to, or maybe even the ones that Nagash and Sigmar had battled before like chaos had even come, what we mentioned earlier. They start to awaken now because it's like someone's basically hit a dinner bell and gone, time's up, boy, ready. And Mm -hmm. Nagash is now essentially souped up and powered up. And I hand it back to Collins to tell the rest of his uh, Age of Sigma shenanigans. Mm -hmm. Uh, Three more things I'd like to add about this big old ritual. Uh, It also created this big old black hole of magic in the center of Shyish called the Shyish Nadir, which anything that goes into it ain't coming out because it's a black hole. Uh, Except for Nagash, who can temporarily enter it to get a Dragon Ball Z Super Saiyan power up. Uh, it also, uh, there were two other things about Nagash, uh, or the night, the Necro Quake. The, uh, it allowed the Night Haunt, uh, which are like ghosts and wraiths and all that, to just be swarm the mortal realms in the billions. Uh, and the Osiarch Bone Reapers, the, yeah, uh, I like these guys. the, uh, the Bone Marines to the Stormcast Ground Marines are now here. This is how they were introduced as a faction. Uh, and then the last thing I want to bring up about the ritual, uh, be- uh, while one of these Skaven task forces did successfully burrow into the Black Pyramids, one of them uh, burrowed underneath an ocean in Shyish and flooded Skaven Blight with zombie-infested <laughs> waters. Hey, Eli, who do, you, who do you think was leading that one? <laughs> it has to be Thankful. It was it Thankful, be. baby. Poor guy. Poor guy. <laughs> Never taken a know. W in his entire life. <laughs> <laughs> right. God, I love that one. He's <laughs> just he—he he is literally the uh, embodiment of you failed successfully. Like that's he, <laughs> he is a barrel of laughs. <laughs> that was uh, not not quite Nagash, but it was the same like scenario, and I I couldn't leave. I couldn't let that one go. Uh, but. To, uh, to get to this, for a while, the Night Haunt, or the uh, the Necroquake, not not great. Uh, it's it's hard-pressing everyone. You know, the Stormcast, the forces of destruction, like the Orcs and all that. Even Chaos is on the back foot for a bit. Like, the Chaos Gods themselves showed up with avatars to watch Nagash do his thing. Uh, Nagash laughed at them, then they laughed at him when the Skaven blew it up, and then Nagash went back to laughing at them. When he realized, oh, all of reality's covered in death magic. You're all screwed. Uh, so it was a whole bunch of people going. It was just as planned. Until it's once again time for Age of Sigmar to have the only Games Workshop writers who give a damn about elves. <laughs> because the Lumineth Realm Lords are making their stage or making their grand appearance. The the high, high elves. Uh, Tyrion and Teclas, the two gods of Heish, this realm, and the Lumineth, uh, they were they were ready for Nagash. They had a feeling he was going to do some clownery. And they show up and just go to town on Nagash. Uh, of note, Eltharion's back. Uh, Arkin cursed him so hard that every time Teclas would give him a body, it aged to dust. Uh, but that's okay, because he just in, it, uh, inhabited a hollow suit of armor. And Praise Knight. Praise Knight. Uh, not not even not no. He's like a, well, I guess it's kind of like a wraith knight, but he has like no body. It's like floating armor. It's really cool. Like a thousand sun. No, it's cooler. Thousand <laughs> yeah, no no dust. <laughs> no dust. No cringe. Dad doesn't love me. Dad <laughs> let my planet blow up. All all badass. Cool. Uh, and Eltharion even gets revenge on Ark in the Black. Ark in the Black goes somewhere he thought no one would follow because it's so inhospital, and then Eltharion follows him and chucks him <laughs> straight into the magical void uh, nice. because he got he got his revenge, and Teclas blows Nagash up so hard that he can't form a body anymore uh, currently in Age of Sigmar, or at least not a permanent one. Uh, and then casts part one of a big old spell to end the 
pardon me, the Necroquake, and Alario the Everqueen, who is also back from fantasy, cast her own spell called the Lifequake to really end the Necroquake. And uh, the death magic is all dispelled at the cost of sometimes when you're walking down the street, you might become pregnant. Even the dudes. Even what? the dudes. <laughs> no, we made that up. That's not official law. <laughs> shout out! Shout out to Alario the Ever Queen for that for that one. Good Appreciate luck. you, fam. Now my bills are gone up. Uh, now the ghosts, you know, ghosts are a lot less of a problem than night on because they need a uh, death. They're like death demons. They need death magic present to manifest. And since there's a lot less of it, there's a lot less of them. Uh, the rest of Nagash's forces are in disarray because of the damage the Lumineth did to them. And the vampire followers of his are on the brink of civil war because Nagash is no longer around to keep them in check. And the few, like, certainly loyal servants he definitely has left, he's sending out to try and both just get revenge on Teclas. Like, every time Teclas blinks, a new army of the undead is attacking his capitals. Uh, and he's just trying to figure out how to get back for real again. Uh, and for now, that is the end of Nagash. Uh, his story. I do have some brief stuff about tabletop and total war. If anyone cares to add, only be like five minutes. Oh, you can go for uh, it. We'll we'll uh, what at the end. Yeah, why not? All right. Uh, so that meme earlier uh, you sent, Andy. <laughs> uh, the reason his model, original model, looks like that is because the sculptor wanted like a desiccated mummy look, but his higher ups wanted a skeletal look. So he intentionally, like, uh, you know, you look at old Warhammer models, a lot of them look kind of goofy, like they've just not aged super well. Uh, Nagash's was designed that way on purpose, because the sculptor figured, I'm going to design the dumbest, derpiest looking model I possibly can. So they have to say it's not good enough and send it back to, like, be recreated so I can do my desiccated flesh thing. And then they approved it. Oh. Uh, so the joke was on him. Uh, which was that's just funny i mean he's iconic <laughs> now though so uh, at yeah. this point yeah it's just so funny it's dude it's chad nagash <laughs> awesome uh when he came back in the end times and age of sigmar he's almost a thousand points so if you're playing a smaller game you're mm -hmm. you simply cannot use him he's too expensive uh in larger games he's gonna be he could be like half your army so you're building the army around nagash if you want to bring him be prepared you're planning around him that being said, he's one hell of a spellcaster. A uh, complete wrecking ball of one. Uh, resurrecting your ar uh, half your army every turn solely if they're close enough to him. Very funny. Casting eight spells in a single turn is also very funny. Yo, the eight? The yeah, eight spells. Uh, Jeez, uh, he's, got a, he's got a damage bracket, so it gets worse. But yeah, at the, if, if he hasn't taken too many wounds, eight spells a turn. <laughs> Good luck, everybody else. Yeah. Uh, the spell Hand of Dust is very funny uh, because you point at an opponent's model and put a dice behind your hand. Yeah, it yep, still and, exists. Oh, it does. And if, uh, and if they don't pick the hand that has the die in it, the model is just dead. That's awesome. That, that's it. Can't believe uh, they keep that around. That's awesome. Dude, dude, I love that spell. It's so goofy. <laughs> uh, he's got the Gaze of Nagash, which is laser eyes. Like uh, that big... Uh, what is that? I don't. I don't know if anyone's gonna. Anyone ever play Ace Combat? No. Nah. All right. No, there's a big laser tower in it, and that's like that shoots lasers at planes, and that's what Nagash does with his eyes. Ah. Uh, very cool. The gaze of Nagash. He's a very powerful, very funny. Keep him away from Gotrick. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, you're gonna lose uh, not a thousand points to a model that cost half that. Uh, good old Gotrick. Uh, and then, just before I before I cease my ramblings after all this time, Total War, the uh, the Nagash mod is in Total War Hammer Three. Go download it for the love of God! It is so fun. Uh, he's uh, you go from like they, they even modeled the original Nagash model to be his like pre powered up form. Once you take back the Black Pyramid, he becomes New Gash. <laughs> cool. uh, wow. Powered up. Uh, you can decide the entire world needs to get obscene levels of vampiric corruption for 10 turns straight. Hmm. Very funny. Uh, Hand of Dust, they've done it very well in that game. You point at an enemy lord or hero, wait for it to cast, and then there's no more enemy lord or hero. <laughs> uh, recruit, recruit, very funny. Uh, recruiting other legendary lords, you know, the Mortarks and their factions just getting erased from the game. Also very funny. <laughs> 
Uh, and of course, he's down in in a you know in the Southlands in a Hecarim Blood Bowl, uh, which means you get to do uh, Creative Assembly's favorite pastime in Total War, which is just beat the hell out of Teclas. <laughs> Pain. Teclas, uh, yeah, Teclas, Teclas's neighbors are the worst. Uh, but that is the story of Nagash, the great necromancer. Does anyone have any uh, any questions for me? You want to bring it to 40k, don't you, necromancy? I I know you. We've talked about this. I know what you want for necromancy. Yeah, Eldar. Sure I do. I do want. I do want some like ghost Eldars, like Ghost of the War in Heaven. But I want necromancy so bad in 40k <laughs> to be its own thing. I want 40k Nagash. Like, I hate that they wasted on a Primarch's backstory the entire concept of necromancy. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, Mortarian. Oh, they're all dead. It doesn't matter anyways. <laughs> and they were still under chaos. They were chaos necromancers. That's not, that's not how necromancy works. Uh, I think we should do a uh, Caesaric versus Nagash versus episode one of these days. <laughs> I, God, I mean, two undead kings. Yeah. Silent King is a much nicer guy, I think. Oh, I was... I, oh, that... I, I mean... <laughs> Anyone but a Skaven's probably a nicer guy. Yeah. Than <laughs> <laughs> also, do not uh, base coat your Doomsday Arc by hand. Worst mistake of my life. Put Bro, Peter what are, what are right you now. doing? I, got, I, I live in a basement, so I can't use the airbrush while we like. <laughs> this. I've just been doing it. I just, just finished save it. Save it for just later it and take it outside. Yeah, office. but I have to set it up still. And it's like, uh, it's done it. now. It took the entire episode, but... It, just don't just don't attach your doomsday cannon to the to the arc before you paint it. Just <laughs> just all right. Any uh, closing <laughs> thoughts? Andy is the uh, the resident um, learner about uh, fantasy. Um, why what? is like, one thing I, I I keep hearing is about like he gets put down and he comes back up. Is is there physically a way to put Nagash down once and for all? Because it seems like. He's he, he keeps somehow finding a way to crawl back. Is there feasibly a, a way it could be ended? Uh, I would well, I would I have a quick I'll have a quick go at that question. I think me and Colin have said perhaps he might be so because he's a god of death. He might be so intrinsically tied to the realm of death that he's almost he's like a concept. I don't know how to get a concept. I don't know what what do you think, Colin? I think like the thing like in fantasy originally he invented necromancy. It wasn't a thing before him. So, and he was the best at it by far. So in fantasy, it's like, maybe you could have, but it's like, you're trying to kill the first ever necromancer who perfected everything about it. <laughs> you're it's trying not, to kill the Isaac News- Newton of necromancy. I, like, yeah. yeah. He just invented it and he was really good at it. And like, oh, I've just inv- invented calculus, but with dead people. Like, oh, cool. Yeah. How long so did that take you? Like a week. <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> you're not, you're not getting rid of them. And like Hal said in Age of Sigmar, he's now like the incarnate of death. Like he's the only god of the dead anymore. There might be a few hidden ones running around, but even if so, he's definitely the most powerful. And the way Age of Sigmar works is the uh, the mortal realms each have like a god that they're kind of tied to. And Nagash is tied to the realm of death. Uh, so the only way I can think of is either maybe if you can do something like the chaos gods did originally after the end times and lock them up in some magical BS crypt, or you need to destroy the entire afterlives, every single one in Age of Sigmar. Or you need to drive a gigantic soul gem and just put him in. Yeah, <laughs> and new one, new ones pop up as time goes on, and new civilizations will arise. By the way, so you're gonna do you're gonna have to do a lot of killing, a lot of afterlife slaughtering. Or maybe you resurrect him and bring him back to life, life, if you know what I mean. But I, I, they obviously won't kill him anytime soon. Maybe, but I don't. I don't know if that would even work. Well, if he's not dead, ne- like you can't kill well, death. He, well, yeah, but like necromancers are still a thing, like in Age of Sigmar. He just, I feel like he would just become an alive necromancer again. And then if you killed him, then he'd be like, "All right, well, I guess I'm back to how I was." But the, the real answer is when the plot demands it. <laughs> oh yeah, the, the real answer is when a gash is no longer profitable enough to justify keeping him around. <laughs> uh, although that is the great. Is anyone else wanting to make any closing statements or closing thoughts? He doesn't uh, seem like a nice man. <laughs> no, but I that, would. Uh, I'll go ahead. Sorry. My final closing thought is that it is a, it is a frequent misconception among the Warhammer community. That the Skaven exist as a as a cool faction designed to expand upon the lore and setting and sell cool models. 
the real reason the Skaven exists is to ensure that Nagash can never, ever have nice things. <laughs> well said, truly. Uh, but with that being said, though, we hope um, everyone listening or watching has enjoyed uh, today's episode. It was nice to... We, we do love... Uh, the, it is in our heart of hearts. We do love fantasy on here, and we hope any excuse to talk about it is very much welcome. Um with that being said, though, the next episode we will be talking about uh, we part three of the uh, Great Crusade, so a return to the uh, so forty k thirty k timeline. But obviously, we're very very happy to talk about more fantasy stuff. Obviously, please if you like fantasy stuff, you really gotta let us know on these ones with like you know likes and comments because that's you know we're, we're gonna obviously listen to it if people uh, want it. And uh, I think with that being said, though, again, thank you so much for listening, for watching, and we'll catch you all on the next one. Peace. Take care. Take care, everyone.